Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Alan Grossenheider, and I serve as the Deputy University Librarian. Um, thank you for coming to today's lecture, The Evolution of Malware, subtitled Ninja Malware Attack. <laughs> this is part of our Pacific Views, uh, the library speaker series. This series is co-sponsored by the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor. Um, it was launched this year to give UCSB faculty and graduate students a platform to share their research, publications, and creative work with the UCSB community and the broader public. The library's intellectual and cultural car crossroads of campus welcomes the opportunity to celebrate the achievements of our faculty and students. When we open our new library facilities, which, well, no, you can't see it behind me because we closed the blinds, which if the blinds weren't there, but when you're out in the lobby, you can look down upon our new building, we'll have even more space for ex exhibitions and events like this, sharing the work and knowledge of our faculty and students. Today, I'm honored to introduce the second speaker in our Pacific Views series, cybersecurity expert Giovanni Vignier, um, as our spring quarter speaker. Professor Vignier, is in the UCSB's computer science department. His research interests remind me of a CIS detective show or maybe perhaps a, a spy movie. They include the following, malware, web security, vulnerability analysis, and intrusion detection. He's director of the Center for Cybersecurity at UCSB and co-director of UCSB's security lab. He's also part of the International Secure Systems Lab and Epic Fail Hacker Groups. Every year he organizes International Capture the Flag, the world's largest hacking competition. He's received millions of dollars in research funding from the National Science Foundation and U.S. Army and is a co-founder of Last Line Incorporated, a company that develops solutions to detect and mitigate advanced malware. In 2004, he earned the UCSB Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award Professor Vignier received his master's and doctoral degrees from Politecnico di Milano, the Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy. Today's lecture will last about 50 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of questions, and then please join us for a reception in the lobby afterwards. With no further ado, I ask Professor Vignier to come up Thank and you. enlighten us about what we might do during a ninja malware attack. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the very thorough introduction. So, uh, as he so well said, they're going to be talking about ninjas. And uh, ninjas are very uh, dear to computer scientists. A uh, few of you might know that there is a diatribe uh, between ninjas and pirates. We always wonder who would win between those two categories. I say ninjas. But <clears throat> who am I? I'm a professor of computer science here at UCSB. Uh, my research is focused mostly on system security. That means that um, I build system to solve uh, problems that usually have an impact on our lives from the security point of view. Uh, started to focus on malware around 2004 uh, with also Dick Kemmer, who's here, uh, who is the reason why I came to UCSB, by the way. Uh, we built and made available to the public. Uh, they're, they're hacking each other in front of here. Uh, so um, we, we built some system, we develop research, and one thing that we like is to create system that people can use. And so we create these portals where people can go and, for example, submit programs, and we can evaluate them and tell them if it's malware or not. Or they send us a web page, and we will visit that web page and try to figure out if that page is malicious and would attack them. Um, I also lead Shellfish, which is a hacking group, just a group of my grad students and various people. We go to hacking competitions, which are perfectly legal. Um, and we are the longest run running hacking team at DEF CON, which is sort of the world championship of hacking. Um, I also do that as an educational tool. I think that competitions are a great way to foster education and to convince students to go well beyond the call of duty. And so every year now for more than 12 years, we organize the largest educational capture the flag in the world with thousands of students connecting to UCSB and just hack the hell out of each other for eight hours. And I recently, a few years ago, I started uh, a company with another professor at UCSB, Chris Krugel, uh, that focuses on analyzing malware. But I will not talk about that. I will talk about 
what we call the malware revolution. Yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. You look at web pages and see if they're safe? Is that what you're Yes, and I'll tell you more about it. So um, part of the evolution of malware is the, both the scale and the motivation behind malware attacks. So at the very beginning, some of you might recall, at the beginning of time, we had mostly cyber vandalism. You had viruses would come to your computer and delete files, or they were incredibly annoying. But, you know, we were not talking about, you know, raging amount of money being wasted. At the beginning of 2000s, so of, however, um, a few people started to understand that if they could compromise a lot of computers and control them, so instead of simply compromise the computer and leave them, you know, compromised, they would have those computer call back home, open a network connection and say, hey, I'm here, what do you want me to do? That computer suddenly becomes a bot. The bot herder is who controls these computers and can ask these computers to do anything. They can launch attacks on the uh, controller behalf, they can steal your personal data, they can simply harvest bitcoins and make that person rich. This, from the 2000 to the um, 2010s, has become an enormous, amount, an enormous problem that has cost you know, billions of dollars collectively to the economy. And of course, there is what we have seen more recently, that is targeted attack and cyber warfare. In this case, there is not a very, uh, it's not that much different from the previous set of actors, but while uh, while the bot, the, the, the bot creators were motivated mostly by financial gain, cyber attacks of this kind, of the latest kind, oftentimes are nation state attack. The first one that was well known was Stuxnet, is something that was developed by the US with the Israeli intelligence community to very selectively break into one specific place in Iran and spin some centrifuges so fast that they would break so they could not enrich uranium. I consider them one of the greatest feats in cybersecurity ever. It's, a, it's, it's amazingly sophisticated, had so much um, interesting, uh, so many interesting ways in which would target the system that you really need to respect that. And this is a brand new world. And the, of course, the targets of these attacks are not sitting there without reacting. We're now continuously uh, exchanging blows between the US and China, the US and Iran. Everybody is attacking everybody. And you know, Mr. Snowden made it really clear that we're very good at it. So what is malware? Uh, malware is fundamentally a program. It's no different than a program, okay? It's something that runs. It's an ex executable of some sort. Could be a binary, like a traditional program. Could be JavaScript, which is the scripting language of the internet, uh, which is in web pages and PDF documents. So people think of PDF documents as this passive document that nobody, but actually it has code inside. And can opening a PDF document can hack you as much as going to a website. And of course, macros embedded in objects uh, and in docs, sorry, macros and embedded docs, embedded objects in documents, browser extension, as we will see in a second. And these programs, first of all, infect your machine and become persistent, which means that every time you reboot the machine, they will be restarted. So they know that they're running at all times. And usually will provide remote access. So at any point, if I have you know, infected his computer, I will be able to say, give me a shell on his computer, and I will be able to have interactive access to his computer. I can browse his files, I can see his mouse moving, I can get a picture of his screen, I can do, you know, take all his pictures from the solstice parade, and can also collect and exfiltrate data. So I can take his credit cards, I can steal the credit cards whenever he goes to a bank and send it to a remote site. And of course, I can also use his CPU to process my bitcoins, or I can just lock all his files and put a pop-up that says, if you don't send me $500, I don't decrypt your files. And you know that would be not fun, right? So what is malware and how does it look like? Once upon a time, it looked like this. I think there are like probably 
Dick is the only person that probably has encountered this type of malware because it's from the 80s. Uh, and you look like this in, you know, a, remember, some of you might remember there was a little worm that would go down and eat all your letters. Uh, then it started evolving. You remember when you say, hey, you have to install something, otherwise you cannot do something. Or there is scareware. This is something that says, your machine is infected. And it's just a website that looks like Windows, but it looks like, you know, warning, your computer is at risk. Click here, activate, install. And what is asking you to install is actually the malware. So you, it's giving you the gun so you can shoot yourself in the foot. People do it. My dad did it. And I say, Dad, really? <laughs> Et tu, Brute? And of course, there is phishing attacks, like mail with weird attachments that will trigger execution of code whenever something is touched. This is very targeted. So how does malware spread? So we know how it looks, but how, do, how does it go around? Well, social engineering is, is becoming the most common thing. You put the praying little cat, and you click because you want to see the video of the little cat doing this. And suddenly you say, hey, oh, I cannot show you the video. Unfortunately, if you want to see the little cat praying, you have to install this other code decoder. And people are like, oh, I got to see the kitty. I got to see the kitty. Install. And say, you have protection on your computer. You don't want to install this software. I install it anyway. Are you sure? <laughs> this file is not signed. It might damage your computer. Got to see the kitty. Got to see the kitty. And eventually, people will be convinced to install the code decoder, and they're infected. So there is not even a lot of work that needs to be done in order to infect people. Just put a lot of kitties. The other way, more subtle, is uh, drive-by downloads. And to explain to you what drive-by downloads attacks are, I have to start with the premise of also what targeted attacks are. And to explain to you what targeted attacks are, I'm going to talk about Alex Reagan. Alex Reagan is the person that actually uh, invited me to this thing, uh, to this talk. It's not a thing, it's a talk. And if you go to the Santa Barbara Library, actually there is nothing about Alex Reagan. You know? So I never met before Alex, and I had no idea how she looks like. So what do you do? I want to target Alex Reagan. I want to break into her computer. So I go to Facebook. All of this is public. We're not friends, never met before. I go to, and I say, well, there is an Alexandra Reagan. It's possible, and, but I still don't know if this is the Alex Reagan, because if you go on Facebook, there are like, like 50 Alex Reagan. Some of them are men, so I realized that that was not the case. So who is Alex Reagan? Oh, let's look. Oh, no friends. Damn, yeah, she, she knows about privacy, and she doesn't want me to fish her. Well, let's go to Intellius. This is a very little known concept. You go to Intellius, you don't have to pay a dime. It's a free site. You put Alex Reagan. And I obscure the age because I don't want to embarrass anybody, and it's not a good thing to expose everybody. But now I have a lot of information about Alex Reagan and you know, California, University of California, Santa Barbara. That's probably her. Okay? And I know, for example, people she's related to. And I found the first one, Andrew Plantinga. Well, let's look him up. Who is Alex Reagan? Oh, he's a professor at Brand School. Oh, definitely, this is the Alex Reagan. Now I know it's her. And I know that she might know this person. Maybe they're married, maybe they're you know, friends. Well, Facebook. But this guy has different uh, privacy thing. And actually, show me that. Alex Reagan is actually his friend. Awesome. Now I know that these two people are friends, and I know his email. As my students now in the back already are smirking at this, of course, I set up a website that, uh, actually I send an email that pretends to be from Andrew Plantinga to Alex Reagan. You have to understand that when you send an email, you can pretend to be whoever you are. You just write it, say, I am Andrew. There is no authentication unless you use cryptography and signatures. And I send HTML email. So even though this is my personal machine at UCSB where I injected a little attack against Alex, she will see something that looks like brand.ucsb.edu. So this will result in an email that looks like this. 
actually, this is the one I sent to myself because I don't have access to, uh, I, will, I will not admit to have access to <laughs> Alex's account. But you can see, it doesn't, it looks to totally awesome. Is the brand new CSB.edu based survey. And it's from her friend. Of course, she's going to click on it. And when she does, she will get, you know, something that looks like a survey. And Andrew works on land use decision based on environment. So I created something that looks like this. And the moment she click on this, if she go to this web page that I set up, she will be infected. OK? Of course not. Nothing happens. Because it would be, of course, you know, not nice. But in theory, that is what could happen. And I'll give you a little more details about this. So really, the main problem here is that once upon a time, we thought about security this way. People from the outside trying to get into the inside. We had the perimeter. You know, we have firewalls. Nowadays, completely different. What do we do? The bad guy find ways to lead you outside. You go to them exactly in the way I did. I will find a way to send you an email that make it possible for you to resist to click on that link because it's your friend and you know it's so familiar. And we see that. We uh, um, saw an, a study on attacks on NGO, especially uh, Tibetan NGOs, where this email that were coming from Chinese attackers were so sophisticated. They knew they, they, they're going to have a meeting the day after at 5 p.m. and say, this is the agenda for the meeting. And it contained an Excel spreadsheet with an attack. So this is our brand new world, and we have to be able to understand how to protect ourselves from these type of attacks. But I want to tell you a little bit more about Drive by Download Cat, because I think that Bob here was a recent victim. So suppose that there is a website, and this website is vulnerable. And I am the bad guy sitting down there, and I scan the internet for vulnerable software. I find the bug. And I exploit it. This is something called, you know, it's a type of injection called a SQL injection. But the result of my attack, which is completely, uh, you know, invisible, is that a little iframe, a little more content will be added to this website. So this site is not malicious. Actually, it's Surfline, you know, where I check for surf information. But it's not malicious per se. But because this guy included this iframe, now guess what happens? Whenever the user visits the website, because of this invisible iframe, the browser gets redirected to another website in a way that is, for you, nothing changes. You don't see that. It's a, it happens in, a in the background. It's called a redirection. It's sort of like when you go to a website and you have to include an image from another website. Then the browser go fetch the image and show it in the browser. You don't have to, you know, do it on purpose. It just does automatically. The site redirects again and again in more and more evil website until you get to evilbuster.com, who, guess what, sends you a nasty piece of JavaScript whose goal is to fingerprint your environment. So it gets in your machine and say, mm, let's see what this guy's at. Oh, he has a Windows 7, unpatched, and he happened to have Flash. Ooh, Flash, nice. Is a buggy version of Flash? Oh, yeah, there is a bug. OK. Exploit it. It will immediately execute code in your machine, exploiting that bug. And what this code does, take a nice bot, completely inflect on machine. And from that point on, you are under the control of this person who has another few million like you. So don't feel alone in this tragedy. And every time you go to a bank or something like that, your information is sent to the bad guy who just use it send it on the underground economy. If, I don't know if you know, but your social security numbers, credit card, bank account are sold and bought on the under, in the underground economy uh, every day. Not yours specifically, but you know, people. So this is the bleak picture. It gets a little bleaker because how do we detect this stuff? So as you can see, and here I, I will get slightly technical, but I will try to stay as far from um, being super technical because it becomes, you know, I will get two kids excited there and everybody else <laughs> sleeping. Uh, <clears throat> so the basic idea is that you have to look both at what happens in the network. So, you know, you can observe either locally or globally how communication happens. 
And you have to recognize, looking at the content of the communication and at the reputation of the endpoints, what is going on. For example, you know, you go to CNN.com, you know, CNN.com has been around for a while. It's a website that's been around for, say, 15 years. His reputation is really solid because, you know, it's a, it's a website that's been around forever. The, most of the site that will attack you have been active for, you know, less than an hour. Because the moment they come up and they start attacking you, there is somebody who's playing whack-a-mole with them and shut them down continuously. So they have to, what they call, use network agility, which is one of the ninja moves of the bad guys. So they continuously change their position on the net, the IP addresses they use, the domain names they use, to a frequency that is just enormous, okay? So using reputation is a very effective way of, you know, shutting down these systems. Uh, <clears throat> and also, of course, we can look at the programs that get downloaded, and we perform program analysis. And our research in our group has been largely focused on these two points. Analyzing network activity to extract, using, for example, machine learning and other techniques, to extract patterns of behavior that can allow us to detect if something bad is happening on the network. At the same time, there is program analysis. So looking at a program and say, are you notepad completely harmless or you are the most toxic piece of malware that I've seen? And this might seem something that is easy. It's actually very complicated because the person who wrote the really toxic thing will try to look as much as notepad. And this becomes a war of the minds. It's us developing novel techniques to detect and expose very sophisticated programs that try to go the ninja way and not be detected. There is the famous joke on the Onion that the very successful demonstration of the ninjas and there is a complete empty street. So the problem here is, of course, we have an arms race. So we started in, in the 70s or early 80s with uh, malicious binaries that were just bad, bad programs. People realize, hey, I can write a signature. If I see this little pattern here, I know you're bad. And the guys say, okay, I just encrypt myself every time I, I get delivered to somebody. It's called a polymorphic virus. It changes shape. It does always the same thing. It just changes his appearance so you cannot use a signature or a string to detect that person. And so now what we're doing, we're running these programs in a sandbox. So we're doing dynamic analysis. We run them in a fake environment. They say, oh, infect me, infect me. And if the guy starts to infect you, ah, ah, I got you, you're a bad guy, okay? So that's the basic concept of a sandbox, a contained environment in which you execute these bad programs and you find out if they're gonna try to harm you or not. And of course, right now, what we see is what we call evasive malicious binaries. Now, these programs have evolved again, and now they look around and say, wait a second, am I in a real computer or in some sandbox that is trying to execute me? And we have some really funny story, because for example, we ran a program at UCSB called Anubis, which is still available, uh, where you can submit a program and find out if it's malicious or not, okay? Uh, the person, the first person that created the sandbox Sandbox was a student of Chris Krugel called Andy Moser. And so there was a user called Andy in, in the installation of the sandbox. And suddenly in malware, it started to appear some checks. They say, if there is user Andy, terminate. Because the, the programmers realized that they could use this feature, the fact that in the Windows system there was a user called Andy to realize they were being analyzed by us and terminate execution. So the challenge now is how do we do this? How do we win this war? And of course, we, did, we saw the same exactly with JavaScript. We saw malicious JavaScript. We see obfuscated polymorphic JavaScript. We have a sandbox, and now we see the evasive one. So is it successful? Yes. We did a study about uh, using uh, virus total data for whoever knows what that is. We know it's not the right thing to do, but we did it anyway. Uh, but pretty much we, we look at malware that we see in large networks, and we find out that the first day that we see a piece of malware, 
around 50% of the antivirus product that are out there were able to recognize that piece of malware. And of course, as the time goes by, they get better and better. Overall, more scanners are able to detect more samples. But there is, especially at the beginning, there is quite there are two weeks in which most antivirus products are completely blind. Why? Because the bad guys do exactly the same in in their you know Russian. Um, they're mostly from Russia. In 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 their in their Russian underworld, they have you know. All the products, Trend Micro, Symantec, McAfee, Kaspersky, and every time they have to push something malicious to the world, the first check, would you detect it? Yes, oh, let's change it. Would you detect it? No, okay, next. Would you detect it? No, okay, next. And when they're clear, they send it out. So it takes a while for antivirus companies to catch up. And that is because it's very easy to evade static analysis. So it's a little more technical, but not too much. Static analysis um, is a very powerful analysis technique for programs. You analyze programs without executing, okay? It's sort of like, a program is like a recipe. So static analysis is like reading the recipe and find out if you know, the resulting dish would be good or not, okay? You don't do the recipe, you just look at it. The advantage of this is that you are not going to be infected because you're not executed anything. And in theory, you know, the program cannot defend itself. They cannot, since you're not executing, you cannot check around for user Andy on the file system because you're not even executing it. Unfortunately, this static analysis works really well when the program that you're analyzing is not resisting your analysis because it's incredibly easy to make static analysis pretty much useless. And that's where the antivirus, the traditional antivirus that are largely based on static analysis fail pretty substantially. And in addition, static, static analysis works when you have all the code. So what if I execute some code and then I say, hmm, I'm executing. Okay, now I'm gonna go on the internet and download this old piece of code, and the, the first part is completely benign, but the thing that is downloaded afterwards is terrible. It's gonna infect your system, do horrible things to you and your files. So uh, it's very difficult to perform static analysis unless you have uh, all the information. And nowadays, there are packers like this, they're commoditized, they're tools that hackers can buy, and you know they simply, um, uh, they simply pack uh, um, everything um, and even resist dynamic analysis. For example, by detecting, for example, you can see in this tool there is Anubis here. This is a tool that will pack the software in a way that automatically detects if you're running in a sandbox and if it's running in a sandbox, will stop working. And there are a few of those, actually there are a bunch. So you can go and try to evade uh, malware. So, how do you solve this problem? The most important problem is visibility. This is a one lesson learned from our research in dynamic analysis. Static analysis works for other things. For malware, you need to execute the program. And you have to execute the program at a certain level of granularity. So, in traditional sandboxes usually look only at the interaction of the program with the operating systems, so the underlying operating system, sorry, this is a technical part, but it's sort of like, suppose that I only know when people get in and out of a room, but they don't know what they do in the room, okay? That's limited visibility. Still, if somebody gets in and out of a room, say, 70,000 times a minute, that's probably a program, you know, you can look at it that way. But we found out that using what we call full system emulation, you can have the granularity that you need in order to understand really if something not only is doing something bad, but if something is trying to evade detection by, for example, fingerprinting the environment. And in fact, you know, we, the important behaviors might happen in the black zone where there is no visibility otherwise. And you know, this is pretty much the only time that I, but this is actually what we based our company on. 
You know, we found this through research and we understood that this is the right approach and this put us at a great advantage um, with respect to our competitors. Another more interesting way to find out if something is evasive is to put them in two different rooms. So we did quite a bit of research uh, here at UCSB on identified split personality programs. So we want to see if a program presents completely different behaviors. So first, you, we run the program in a reference system. Oftentimes could be what we call a bare metal system. So instead of being a sandbox, it's an actual machine with actual CPU and actual hard drive that looks exactly like one of the targets. And we sort of log all the information that all the actions that this program performs. And then we run the same program somewhere else, in a sandbox, for example, of different kinds. And you would expect that the behavior is the same, right? Of course, in most cases, it is the same. But when you compare the two and you find different behaviors, this is a clear evidence that this program is fingerprinting the environment and having two different types of behavior uh, according to the environment, which is a clear sign that this program is malicious. Maybe we don't know what it does, but imagine if notepad.exe would completely run in a way on his computer and another way on his computer. Program's supposed to be you know, deterministic or do always the same thing. If they don't run in similar system the similar way, it's a sign that this is bad. So why is this research say, oh, you at uh, UCSB just run things on different computers? It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, comparing actual behaviors is a research topic in itself. Um, it's very difficult to collect this behavior in a way that is transparent. So there is a little bit of forensic, a little bit of machine learning, and a little bit of uh, engineering that goes in it. So what needs to be done now by our community or the security community in general is really to use evasive behavior against sandbox as a signal to detect maliciousness. It's sort of like if somebody is approaching a bank with, with a ski mask, maybe he hasn't robbed the bank yet, but damn, the ski mask, you know, unless you are in Lake Tahoe, you know, which you know, would be a false positive, uh, it's a problem. So if you're trying to evade detection, I might use that as a signal, as a way to detect that you're malicious. I don't know if you're going to rob the bank or set it on fire, or break the window with a stone, but at least I know you're trying to do something shady. And also, uh, we can use very interesting technique to understand stalling. Why? Because I haven't told you the worst part of dynamic analysis is that you cannot run a program forever, right? At last time, for example, we analyzed between 200,000 and 500,000 programs a day. So we execute these programs, we extract information, blah, blah, blah. We execute every program around for around four minutes. Okay? And it's still, we have racks of computer that just churn, execute this stuff, and extract behaviors, and all that cool stuff. But, you know, a program say, oh, I heard on that talk of, you know, that I saw on the web with Giovanni that they wait four minutes. I'm going to wait eight. <laughs> and then do bad stuff. So in most situation, who cares? You know, I'm going to infect his machine four minutes later. Big deal. But I completely evaded Giovanni's system. Well... Not exactly. Uh, what one important part of, um, of our analysis is to, for example, identify programs that are stalling, that are not progressing. And of course, this is a very, very difficult problem in computer science and an insolvable problem in the general case, of course. <laughs> there is a, you know, so exactly, there is some undecidability issue there. But this is what we need to do in order to, can you open this for me, please? Uh, this is what we need to do in order to uh, identify that a program is doing really <laughs> nice. What to expect from your colleague? Backstabbing. All right. Or backwash. <clears throat> and, and so it, it's really important to identify, for example, if there is a loop that is not doing anything, if there is a sleep operation, say, oh, I'm going to go to sleep for two hours. And so we have to detect that and find a way to pass it. So, and we're, we're doing okay. But of course, the problem becomes the next 
thing that I think we will have to deal with. And this is something that we are not dealing with yet, but we will deal with, is what we call mimicry. So instead of stalling and not doing anything, which is already a form of evasion, so say, oh, why are you not doing anything there? Okay, you should do something. It's weird for a program to not do anything, do something. The program can say, oh, I'm doing something. I'm, do I'm doing whatever Notepad does. And oh, we all know that Notepad is absolutely benign. So I am mimicking the behavior of Notepad. And once the analysis is over, I will sort of like, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde turn into a zombie and do horrible things. So this is going to be difficult. So the problem is that this will force us to do something called eliciting. So the next challenge in our research will not only to detect evasion, use evasion as a signal for detection, identify installing loop, identifying abnormal program construct that are identifiable as malicious, but also to prod programs to elicit, to perform in a malignant way as soon as possible. And this is another unsolvable problem because, of course, you cannot easily do that. You have only good heuristics, good approaches, and a ton of research that goes into, okay, I see that you have this particular construct that it's a if-then-else. Oh, I'm going to put this here so you actually go down this way. So eventually, I can get you to do something malicious and then, gotcha, you're a bad guy. Of course, this is not very easy. We have done some very preliminary uh, analysis, and we started doing that on browser extensions. Who knows what browser extensions are? Okay, very good, very good. Browser extensions are programs, are uh, programs that are HTML plus JavaScript. They, uh, they're an extension to your browser that allow you to do more things. So there are good extensions, there are bad extensions, there are silly extensions, but the basic idea is that there are a piece of code that runs in your browser and have access to quite a privileged API. An API is an application program interface. That means the extension has a way to interact with your browser that is not the same way of a web page. Okay, it has more access to your browser. For example, you can access the keyboards, the, the keys that you type. If you give permission to an extension, we'll see all the tabs that you have open. I can see all the websites where you go. You can even see all the forms that you submit, et cetera, et cetera. So you already got the idea. One famous one is ad block. You hate, you hate ads, so you put the ad block extension. Whenever you go to a website, you know, the extensions as a list of bad sites that will give you ads, and whenever you see your browser going there, say, uh-uh and you don't have those annoying, flashy, you know, uh, seizure-inducing uh, flash uh, ads on your browser. Very good. Very used by many people. And then there is the total silliness, like the Facebook color changer. You decide that the blue of Facebook makes you blue, and you want to see the world in pink. You get this, and suddenly you can have Facebook totally pink. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> Who would do that? But I would like to bring your attention to the fact that this is installed by 347,000 users, okay? So what do you think the bad guys do? The bad guys go by the young kid who put together this extension and say, I want to buy your extension. Here, $20,000. So $20,000 for Facebook caller? Yes! <laughs> Here's my credential. The code is yours. See you. And these guys just bought a 350,000 people botnet for $20,000, which is nothing. They can do that in the first day. When they change this thing and we auto-update, we'll push to 350,000 browser malicious code who will steal all their information, all their sites, all their passwords, and happily ever after. So it's really bad. Why? Because if, for example, the Facebook color changer asks you to access your data on all websites. Wait, was the Facebook color changer or every website color changer? Access your tabs and browsing activity. So this extension is asking a lot more access 
than it should, and will it use this for evil? We don't know, right? So let's talk about malicious extensions. So the problem is that we don't really know, I mean, we didn't know until you know, uh, we wrote this paper, uh, if these malicious extensions were actually uh, a problem. So we say, okay, the problem is that we can you know, execute them, analyze them. The main problem with malicious extension is that you know, they can inject advertisement, they log keystroke, they can perform kinds of, all kinds of fraud, but they will do only on certain sites. So how do we elicit the behavior? How do we force these extensions to actually show us some bad behavior? Bad, 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 so we can get them. So we develop a system called Hulk, because it's the solution that makes Bruce Banner you know, go crazy, uh, that elicits behavior by visiting page, logs the actions performed by the X extension, and as rules to characterize their behavior. And <clears throat> so the main problem is, how do we trigger, trigger malicious code? Well, you could you know, load an extension and go to a million sites. The problem is that it's not very scalable if you have to analyze you know, thousands and thousands of extensions. So we have created two things. You know, we have created what we call a honey page, and also we have do some program analysis to find out what sites might be targeted by this extension. And also we created a fake super browser or super crawler inside the extension. What is a honey page? Well, these extensions, in order to understand if they have to attack you, they say, oh, do you have this piece of HTML? Because if you do, you are on Facebook. So whenever they ask something like, hey, do you have the Facebook news feed? We say, without, without going to Facebook, say, of course we have, okay? And so by eliciting this, we try to see what they're asking us, and we give it to them every time. So they always feel super happy. This has problems otherwise. I saw the 40 minutes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> also, what we do, we go to a lot of sites, but instead of really going to the sites, we modify the browser, so we pretend to go to millions of sites in a matter of seconds. And by doing this, we can force it. It's like going to a, an extension and say, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Wells Fargo, I'm on Bank of America, but really, really fast. I cannot talk that fast, okay? <laughs> and then we categorize the behavior. For example, there are certain, uh, certain extensions that prevent uninstalling. Yeah, that's pretty bad, okay? Steal email and password or do key loggers. There are other behaviors that are like, eh, shady. For example, it injects, injects JavaScript dynamically so you cannot see it on the original extension. They, you, they, they evolve, they, they, they analyze, they, they sort of like execute external code that is very long. These are shady. We don't really know if they're always bad, but they could be. Results, we went to the Chrome Web Store. We downloaded uh, around you know, 47,000 extensions. We got some extension from Anubis. And we found 130 malicious extension and at least 4,000 that we think they have problems, okay? So this shows that, you know, it's, if you look at Chrome, it's around 10%. That's pretty high, okay? That's pretty damn high. For example, there is a similar Sites Pro. It's installed by millions of users. Well, in some situations, it puts you an ad. In other situations, suddenly, it asks you to install some media player, update now. So it becomes a platform for malware distribution. So at this point, you're terrified. And you'll say, oh my god, I will turn off the internet right now. Somebody's already on the phone with Cox, say, disconnect. Well, backup, backup, and then backup. That's uh, the funny story is that this is not my computer, because this morning I was in a meeting, I was bored, and I thought about installing a program called OmniPlan for Mac to do GAN charts so that I can manage my students better. And then OmniPlan say, oh, you have an old version of Mac OS X, you have to upgrade. I say, oh, I guess I have to upgrade. Eight hours later, Evans finished the upgrade. C computer completely locked. This version of the presentation was on that computer. <laughs> I freaked out, absolutely. Freaked out, okay? And at that point, oh, I have like seven backups. 
let's see if one of those have it. I have crash plan, which is the best. I, I, don't, I don't get a dime from them, get crash plan. I went on it, sure enough, the presentation was there. Okay, use two-factor authentication, always, whenever you can. Gmail, you use two-factor authentication. There are little movies that explain you how to do it, I will not tell you now, but whenever you can use two-factor authentication, which means that in order to log in on your Gmail, you need your phone in addition to your password. So if somebody, I'll show you right now, if somebody steals my password and they want to enter into my Gmail account, they have to know these names. Don't take pictures, thank you. <laughs> they have to know these numbers that change continuously. And unless they have my phone initialized on Google, they cannot log into my account. So this is extremely powerful. Do it. Use a password manager. You know, instead of having all the password chow chow for, like Dick knows very well, uh, <clears throat> please use a password manager that you have to remember one password for. Use two-factor authentication with the password manager, otherwise it's pretty much useless. And at that point, you will have a way more secure setup for your password, your credit card information. You can put all sorts of information. I use LastPass. People use one password. There are plenty out there. Please use them. It, it will make the hacker really mad. Of course, the best situation is to monitor your bank and credit card account always for weird charges. You know that already. One thing that you don't know is that if your credit card or bank account, a uh, personal one, gets hacked, you get your money back. If it's your business, you don't get your money back. So we saw business destroyed by hackers who came in like, you know, car dealers. Hacker go in, siphons out $60,000. By changing their payroll and paying a bunch of money mules across the city, money is shipped with Western Union to Pakistan, bye-bye. And the car dealer is gone. Small businesses are killed this way all the time. Use a browser with self-update, like Chrome, other browsers do that now. It was the first one that wasn't like, do you want update now? And people were like, ah, no, no, I don't want update. It could break stuff. No, Chrome will just update. We did a study here at UCSB, and we hijacked from the bad guys a website that was sending those nasty JavaScript that would crack your computer. Instead of us sending the bad JavaScript, we sent a very simple piece of JavaScript just to fingerprint the machine so we would have a study on the victim population of this particular cybercrime group. There were people coming to the website with Windows 95. <laughs> oh yeah, Windows 95. I don't, know, I don't know even the hardware that runs Windows 95. Anyway, one thing that is for the most advanced people, if you do anything really sensitive, use a virtual machine. A virtual machine is called VMware, VirtualBox. It's, VirtualBox is free. You install a computer within your computer, and then you use that computer to do your banking. When you're finished, you shut down that computer, and unless you meet some uber hacker that is able to get your VMDK from the machine, et cetera, et cetera, which is also possible, you're pretty much protected. And of course, don't click on the survey link like Alex uh, did, did you receive my email or no? You didn't. Uh, I thought so. I, th I think you're, you have a Barracuda uh, mail firewall that actually blocked it. I, I, I checked it, but I tried. I tried. Okay, in conclusions, malware is in continuous evolution. Um, it's a process. It's not a phase. It's not going to change uh, anytime soon. Uh, I think that mimicry is going to be a big problem, and our very difficult task will be to elicit Malware behavior, it's an open problem that I think has great ramification from the security point of view, which means that we are not out of a job. Uh, visibility is key, so always remember your analysis has to be very, very um, uh, fine grain. And also, I think that now we have to move to a model where analysis is ubiquitous. We have Dropbox folders, we have extensions, we have programs, we have operating system. We have the tools to analyze everything all the time, okay? Not now. We have the tools, I mean, advanced corporations and super secure system do this already. You cannot put a single file in a network unless it's been scanned. We're not like that. We're like, yeah, it's very, it means it's very important. Visibility means uh, how 
deep into the malware or into a program actions you can look. If you look, remember when I show only the high level interactions instead of the every single instructions on the other side, that's the type of visibility that you wanna have. You wanna have very fine grained visibility when you analyze malware. There are a lot of sandboxes out there that use very sort of like coarse grain visibility and I think that's a problem. And if you use that type of technology, I think that the, the malicious guys might, might have the upper hand. Okay, so with this, I'm done. My, my message is, you know, we need, for programs, we need electron microscopes, not the original ones. And that's why our research focuses on advanced malware analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, you you need to have some ex the two factor means that you need something additional that the hacker cannot control. So it has to be a phone. It could be an RSA key. There are these little devices that the only thing they do they have a rolling number and they they are out you know uh, two factor authentication. Actually, I can show you one. Okay, I oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so No. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Yes. We, we hear the government talking about how serious they feel hacking is in the government systems and also Edison utilities and that kind of stuff. Are we, are, is the government able to hire creative enough people to really work and solve, solve these kind of problems? Well, solve is a, is a big word. I said the government is pre doing a pretty good job, the US government is doing a, a very good job. The, I mean, the NSA is a very skilled, powerful entity in this whole war. I think they, they definitely know what they're doing, okay? And now we have a little more insight in what they're doing and some of the stuff they're doing is pretty crazy. So, you know, there is the equation group at the NSA. So I think they're doing their job. Um, there is another aspect of the government, which is, for example, more not in the sort of cyber warfare, which I think they're doing okay, but it's more in legislation that, for example, would force companies to do more secure stuff. And some of the stuff already happened. Now, you know, for example, in California, if you get breached, they have to tell you. You know, probably many of us has received letters saying, hey, your personal blah, 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 it's been blah, 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 and now you get one year of blah, blah, blah. Before, you would be completely, you know, blinded and you would have no visibility into it. It was policy that was passed that made this better. Is this best? No, there is a lot of work that needs to be done at the sort of policy level to make this system more secure. And then there is education. I mean, why not making two-factor authentication as common as having, you know, a bike? You have a fob, you have a bike, you know, that should follow you everywhere. Suddenly things become a lot harder for the bad guys. Also less usable for us, but you know, that's a trade-off. Yes? Uh, one trick that I use uh, when I want to go uh, to my bank site or something that involves money yeah. is uh, I boot my machine from a CD-ROM. Correct. And that can never be infected. Correct. It that's can be a, infected while I'm running. But then it goes away. Then it goes away. Unless it's the NSA and they flash your firmware. But yes, in most cases, yes. Absolutely, that's a good idea. I mean, that's similar to a virtual machine. It's, it's even more secure in, in a way because it's a you know, read-only file system. It's called a live CD. And it's, it's a very effective way. But I think it's not as usable as a virtual machine and you know you are a little more sophisticated than the average person who would have probably a harder time but that's a great way great way to secure your account, your access yes um i've had but never bothered to install something called lps i think it's it's a good because i don't yeah. know what it is no it's <laughs> it, <laughs> it's from the government i supposedly or the air force i think it's an air force anti-security thing so 
Maybe I'll let you know. And yeah, let, let me know because be I never it. heard of it, okay. but I'm sure okay. if it comes from yeah. the government, it's, you should install it <laughs> okay. on your computer. Well, okay. And then on your list of... <laughs> I'm no, there to support it. And then on the list of techniques that I'm not doing, I've been reluctant to use a password manager because I'm afraid, gosh, when somebody figures out how to break into a password manager, you know, then I'm sunk, you know, because everything's all, you know, it's kind of a single point of, you know, the Rosetta true. Stone kind of thing. True, true. But, and also, which one of those ads saying get a password manager, you know, label five stars on PC Mag or whatever, is trustable? So you're saying that one, one, one password, pass? last pass. Yeah. I use last pass. Last oh. pass. L A S T. L A S T. P A S S, yeah. okay. but with two-factor authentication. Yes, right. Giovanni. Yes. No. Wait. Wait. No, wait, wait. One, one, one. She was trying to interject a question. I'm curious. Do you know anything about what exactly anonymous hacker groups do and what it would be classified as? Like, I suppose anonymous and lolsec, because I believe is it cyber vandalism. No, I wouldn't call it do? cyber vandalism. I mean, some forms. I mean, it's labels. It's called cyber hacktivism. So okay. the basic idea is that there is a group of people that um, think that they're, or they believe that they're using offensive security techniques to you know, forward their agenda. And their agenda could be, hey, I don't like uh, ISIS. So every time I find an ISIS site, I denial service attack that, 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 that server. Um, and most of us would be like, yeah, and then they say, well, I don't like the NSA, and so I'm going to you know, take all these documents and put it on WikiLeaks. And we're like, nay, <laughs> depending on where you stand, right? Yeah. So it, it's difficult. You know, in a way, personally, I think that there are ways to do activism in a legal way. I don't think that going in the legal fashion so uh, is, is, the, is the right way, unless you're a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. And you really see, then the, and then we're, you're protected by the law. You're doing something that, in theory, is illegal, but because of the whis whistleblowing law, laws, you're protected. And that, in that case, it's, uh, it's, let's say, acceptable. So their actions would be classified under activism through, I don't know, terrorist means? No, no, I wouldn't say terrorist means because I don't think that terror is their goal. But um, they want, for example, to embarrass the government oftentimes. But no, they can also make mistakes. Suppose that they decided that, oh, that guy is bad, and they suddenly cyber bully this guy, and then this guy was not bad. Okay, who gives these people the you know, power to decide what they are and what they should do? It's very, it's a very, it's very easy to relate to that because you have power, you know what to do, you know how to hack into somebody, and maybe you really want to help, but you're still doing something illegal. Right. So my question is, have you thought about doing that legally first? Well, I'm not one of them that does it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's what the other guy said. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Available soft, is there publicly available software to determine if you have a bot on your machine or a bad extension or something else? I would say, and again, this is not somebody that I get any money from. So far, one system that I really like is called Malware Bytes. Malware Bytes with B Y T E S. I think it works reasonably well. Nothing is perfect, but you know, I think they're. I had good experience with them. But, you know, I, I'm very limited. I'm, I'm not a commercial product analyzer, so I can tell you in general that these things have limited value, but they can help in certain cases. And there was a question here. That Maybe I, one more question, two short well, this ones. Was, this was just a little announcement. So if you're part of the UCSB uh, community, there's gonna be a password manager. We've created a volume license for look for an email on the D list sometime early next month with instructions how to use it if you want to get to it before the D list comes out just give me a call or see me that's awesome All right one more question okay um, but if you were in great admiration of Stuxnet but yes. wouldn't you say that it was used to start cyber warfare we did the first blow of cyber warfare Iran did not retaliate isn't the code public 
The code is public. The code is out. So people are going to use it on, you know, other other things, power plants, etc. I would say I would say it wasn't the first, and thank you. Um, it wasn't the first. I would say is the one that 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 was so sophisticated and so targeted that really you know uh, surprised the community. I must say, you know. I would like that nobody fights anybody, and we're all live in peace and prosper <laughs> together. Um, of course, you know these things happen, and um, should we not do it? Because the other guys are doing it. Well, the problem is it's public now. Other yeah. People can do it to everybody. Not really, because the moment it becomes public, mm -hmm. it becomes also less harmful because you can build a protection against it. So, for example, one thing that Stuxnet was really good at, it's like five zero-day vulnerabilities. So five zero-day exploits. That means there were five different ways that nobody has seen before in which they could hack into a system. And normally malware has one, maybe, okay? There's five. And, and it was very stealthy, it was, um, I'm not saying, I'm not condoning the use of it. Um, I'm just saying, whoever did it, it's a hell of a hacker. Okay, thank you. Well, we are uh, so we the conversation at the reception. You're all invited in the lobby just outside. And on behalf of the library, I do want to thank oh, Giovanni thank you. for a very interesting talk and just a little gift from the library. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you very you. much.